Uh, right, I'll mute everybody and I'll unmute <coughs> you, Bob. <coughs> right. Uh, right, Bob, it should be all yours. Okay. Thank you. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so thank you everybody for um, um, coming along, or at least not coming along, but at least tuning in. Um, and um, thank you, Jackie and Andrew, for all your organisation and for inviting me in the first place. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to speak to you all about this particular subject. Um, what I'm going to do is, is really set out the, um, what the purpose of the map was and why we did it now. Um, I'll also um, say something about the thinking behind it, why it's 1480 and not a, some other date, um, which caused a lot of controversy, I must, I must say, amongst the project team. Um, and then I'll, I'll end by looking at some of the discoveries and research that's gone on, especially over the last um, 30 to 40 years, um, making this really an opportune time to set out both on the map and in its accompanying gazetteer, um, some of the results of this research. But before I start, I really ought to say something about all the people who worked on this. I was only one part of a project team, which was led by Professor Hel Helen Fulton of Bristol University and Professor Peter Fleming of the University of West of England. They really started this whole process going. Um, there was input from Dr. Beth Worley of Bristol University, uh, Professor Roger Leach, um, Southampton University, uh, especially in the light of his published work on Bristol houses, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. My former colleague, um, Pete Insoll, um, who's my successor at Bristol City Council. He's now head of the um, historic environment team at the City Council. Um, Rob Harding, um, who gave a lot of information, but particularly in result, the result of his work on St. James's Priory, which some of you may know, uh, and um, John Bryant, formerly of, the, formerly of the Bristol and Regional Archaeological Services, has got a huge, huge um, um, well of information about Bristol, which we uh, made much use of. The, cartogra the cartography and the technical work, as well as managing the day-to-day -day running of the whole thing, um, was by Giles Darks of the Historic Towns Trust. He He's the one who made the map beautiful, various ideas and scribbles into something which is um, very legible. And there's also valuable input from um, David Martin, who's the senior conservation officer of Bristol City Council, as well as staff from Bristol Museums and Bristol Archives. So a great deal of thanks to them. So why do we need a map? Why, why are we producing this now? Well, the last one was produced um, over 40 years ago. And this, this is, as you can see on the screen, this is my rather dog-eared copy, um, now very much out of print, uh, although you can see a digitized version on the Historic Towns Trust website if you, if you wanted, and I'll, I'll give you their, their website address at the end of the talk. So this was produced um, in the mid 1970s. It's in a book form, a very large book form, I'm not quite sure what size it is, it's not quarto, it's probably about A3 size, so it doesn't fit easily on a bookshelf, um, but it's an extremely important piece of work. It's really rather different from the map I'm talking about tonight. It's still relevant, um, and is an important commentary on Bristol's history from its origins until the 19th century. And it was written by the his, um, eminent historians, Mary Lobel and Eleonora Caris Wilson, uh, a very eminent economic historian. Um, however, since then, this is 1975, since then there's been a huge amount of historical and archeological um, research. Um, and I'll say a little more about that um, later on. But this is really 
I wouldn't say revolutionary. Well, yes, it has revolutionised our, our thinking about how Bristol evolved, and it's answered a lot of questions which were very much outstanding at the time that the um, Atlas was written in 1975. So it was a really good time to produce this. So what's its purpose? Well, its purpose is to provide um, both uh, visitors and residents of Bristol with a succinct and easy to use map with a gazetteer to allow you to navigate around the city with a brief explanation of the monuments that are extant, but also those which have long since disappeared and thus can't be seen. In addition, um, the, there's an introduction on the inside of the cover uh, on the um, to the history of Bristol in and around 1480. And this has been written by Professor Peter Fleming, who's the foremost authority on the period. It's drawn on an ordnance survey base of uh, 1918. This is different, um, which were drawn on a base of uh, a version of the map by Plumley and Ashmead dated to 1828, a very much earlier map. So it's quite different really. Um, it's based on a map which you can't really recognize for itself, an historic map that you can't really recognize for itself. The 1918 map, there's two reasons why we chose that. Firstly, it was unblemished. Um, we were more or less unblemished. The, the uh, version that we had in uh, Bristol archives was okay. It was pretty good. Um, it was marred by the fact that people had stuck sheets together with sellotape. Um, uh, people do this to maps. There were also areas where people had obviously put a coffee or teacup on it. So there was a coffee and tea ring stains on, on, on one or two parts. So it wasn't um, completely um, without faults. And what the Historic Towns Trust did was to use a version from, um, um, from Scotland. Or the, uh, where they have actually digitized a large percentage of historic maps, historic ordnance survey maps. So we use their version, it's a much better version, but it is 1918. Um, so it's just after the First World War, but at the same time, it would be recognizable to Bristolians. They could navigate the city using that 1918 map. Earlier maps, less recognizable. And, and less good condition as well. At the same time, the 1918 map predates the massive destruction that occurred in the 1940s as a result of the, the effects of the Blitz. So um, after that period, Bristol changes, as we'll see in a moment, it changes radically. So we, we needed something which is earlier than that. And the 1918 map really fitted that, um, those criteria very well. I mentioned the, 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 the destruction wrought um, by the Blitz in 1940. It changed the face of Bristol forever. Um, and so, as we can see on this, these images here, we've got on the top, we've got the 1828 Plumley and Ashmead map showing um, Mary Port Street. And alongside it, you've got a Breckenridge image of the early 1820s, so more or less contemporary, showing this lovely narrow street with its timber framed houses, um, very picturesque. At the bottom, you've got the same view, uh, looking towards St. Peter's Church, which itself was bombed and left as a, as a monument to the, to the Blitz. Um, with um, basically a park and hard landscaping around it, and all traces of the street have gone. That is shortly to change, as a little a footnote to that, that's shortly to change as part of new development in this area here, which has very recently received planning permission. This building, which where I, I got my cursor, was built in the 1960s, uh, wrapped around St Maryland Port Church, uh, a very undesirable development for Norwich Union and the Bank of England and other um, offices. Um, that's to be redeveloped with buildings which are probably more hideous um, 
Um, I will say that because I can, because I don't work for Bristol City Council anymore. Um, but one thing that will happen is the street, Mary Laporte Street, will be recreated and the church can once again stand in its own environs um, with its, with its um, graveyard and tower and the ruins of the nave now fully exposed. So that's one good thing. There's not many other good things, but that's one good thing that's going to come out of this. So in maybe five years time, I'll be able to show this a, a very different image of the um, bottom slides. So huge, huge um, changes occurred from 1940. And here we see some images of the kind of destruction. This is the famous Dutch house on the corner of um, um, High Street and Wine Street, one of the most um, iconic buildings in Bristol. All there were lots of postcards uh, produced of it. Everybody knew the Dutch house who, who came to visit Bristol. That was destroyed or largely destroyed as a result of bombing. And on the bottom left, you can see what is there now, although, as I said, that will change over the next five years as a result of new development. But nonetheless, um, that image um, was one which was which went in 1940. Great shame. So it is a very confusing city. Anyone who comes to Bristol, anyone who drives around Bristol will, will appreciate that it, is, it isn't an easy city to get to know, to get to understand. Uh, and, I'm not a Bristolian. When I first came here, I was always getting lost. I just couldn't find my way around. You've got major road schemes like this one. This is the Inner Circuit Road, um, Rupert Street, Lewins Mead. Um, now, um, a street full of cars, canyon-like, um, and um, quite intimidating. Many think many people who come to Bristol think of the Georgian squares, think of Clifton. Um, think of Queen Square, think of called innovations largely from um, people like Brunel. That's what people think about. Um, so schemes before and during World War II were being planned to modernize the city and the impetus for radical change was provided um, with the large scale destruction caused by the Blitz. So it's, if you like, an unwelcome opportunity, um, which was seized by engineers and planners from the 1940s onwards. Um, the city engineer in 1943, in fact, commented, the spirit of adventure is abroad in connection with post-war developments and Bristol would not wish to be behind in this direction. You can see they're really itching to change things radically. So this map is, is an attempt to present the rich and sometimes still visible remains of the medieval town with its churches, monasteries and defences, uh, and not least the castle. Um, in its time were the largest and most formidable in the country. So why did we choose 1480? What, what was the reasoning behind this? Um, we very quickly decided it would be impossible, in fact, too complicated to um, represent on a single map every monument or site of all periods with associated descriptions. That would be just huge. That's, that's a book. That's not a map, um, a single map with a gazetteer on the other side. It would be too difficult. So we thought, well, what date should we use? What, what date should we go for? Um, and for a long time, we thought, well, 1373, that would be a good date because that's when Bristol was created a county, the first provincial town outside London uh, to be granted this distinction. And that seemed a good idea. For a long time, we, 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 we ran, with, ran with that. A few of the members of the project team didn't like that either. They really wanted to go to the sort of, they were, they were disgruntled that we weren't looking at the um, post-medieval. We weren't looking at the 16th, 17th or 18th century periods. And they, we thought, they thought we ought to be looking at that as well. But for the reasons I just mentioned, we just could not expand it out without making the, the, the map into a book, which is perhaps what is needed as well. 
but this is what we were trying to do. So we chose 1480, partly because it still had the features of the medieval town before the major changes of the Reformation in the second quarter of the uh, 16th century, uh, with the removal of most of the monastic foundations and features of the town um, dominated by religious observance. It was still a religious town. Um, and so on this image, these two images, you can see Queen Elizabeth at St. John's Gate. This is a, this is a fanciful image, it's, it's, it's not historically accurate, but it's, it gives you an idea of what it might have been like at the entrance, the main north gate into the town, St. John's Arch, which you can see in the background there. This is the, where the processions came in. This is where royalty, such as Queen Elizabeth, were welcomed by the great and the good. Um, this is where they tried to impress the monarch or any other worthies coming through how important um, Bristol was. It's no accident, for example, you've got the two statues on St. John's Arch, Bellinus and Brennus, who hark back to this mythical idea of Bristol having a, a Roman origin, which of course it doesn't, um, but it is nonetheless, it, it perpetuates this myth that Bristol has great antiquity uh, and, it, and ranks with the great European cities of, of um, great antiquity elsewhere. So it's all kind of this show. And if you went through that gate, what you would look out on, what you'd look out, out on now is that wide in a circuit road I just showed you in a few, a few slides ago. Um, but that same point on the right-hand slide, if, if you stood in the middle of the road, um, well, you wouldn't stand in the middle of the road because you get run over, but if you were to, that's the view on the right-hand side you would have had. You would have had the river with the high ground off to the right, um, with all the monastic institutions ranged around this, this high ground on the north bank of the River Froome. And in, in the cartographic form, what we're looking at are the, the monastic institutions of St. James's Priory here, the Grey Friars, um, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, bits of which still survive, uh, um, the Carmelite Friary, which doesn't survive at all, uh, St. Mark's Hospital, which of course does survive, and further around to the west, uh, St. Augustine's Abbey, now the cathedral. And round on the um, eastern side, you would have glimpsed uh, the remains, or you would have glimpsed the Dominican Friary, the Black Friars, parts of which do still survive. And here we've got a plan of it. This is taken from the historic town's map, uh, showing the layout of the, uh, of the Dominican Friary, which was actually investigated quite extensively during the um, redevelopment of Cabot Circus, the uh, shopping precinct, which is there now, in 2007 or 2008. Uh, and parts of it do survive. Here we have two of the main ranges of the um, Dominican Friary still um, still there, now converted to as a restaurant. And here's a reconstruction of what the Friary may have looked at, looked like based on archaeological evidence from 2007. So 1480 is a good date a late medieval town still there, still with a, a lot of the trappings of um, the, the medieval uh, landscape still there. The other reason is the fact in, 17, in 1479, this wonderful map here was produced um, by a man called Robert Rickart, who was the uh, town clerk of Bristol. Uh, it's actually published in um, a book called The Mayor of Bristol is Calendar, which was first published in 1872, and a later edition has now been published by the um, Bristol Record Society in 2015, edited by Peter Fleming. So you can, you can see a, a more up-to-date um, version of that calendar, or parts of it, um, in 2015. And this map is, is wonderful. It's obviously iconographic. It's not something you, you'd use to, to walk around. Its cruciform shape, I think, is, is important. It shows how um, religious uh, or how religious observance was important in medieval Bristol. You've got the four gates, uh, St. John's, 
Newgate, um, St. Nicholas and St. Leonard's Gate. St. Nicholas, uh, only St. John's um, still survives, of course. In the middle, you've got the High Cross, which was only taken down in the 18th century as a, as a popish relic, to quote the, uh, the objections at the time. And you've got the four main streets. You've got Broad Street, Wine Street, High Street, and Corn Street, the main um, elements of the medieval, of the early medieval town, with the town walls uh, exposed. And this is quite interesting because by this, by 1479, these inner town walls were redundant. In fact, most of them had been demolished. So uh, this is actually a kind of a bit of a fiction, really. So we've got that map, probably one of the earliest town maps um, in Europe. Um, so it's extremely important document. And then we have William Worcester, um, one of my um, heroes. Um, this is the cover of the edited version produced by the Bristol Rec Society in 2000, um, edited by Francis Neal, uh, who went through the original documents, um, which are housed in Corpus Christi College, Cambridge. Um, and she went through all of that and, and transcribed it. And so who was William Worcester? A very interesting person. He was a native of Bristol, in fact. He was born in uh, 1415 uh, and he attended school in Newgate. He studied at Oxford and then went on to work for St. John, St. John Fastolf in Norfolk, working as his secretary, agent and steward of his estates at Castle Coombe in Wiltshire. After Fastolf's death in 1459, Worcester ended up living in Norwich. And he was a keen traveler and wrote several itineraries, uh, including that for Bristol. His visit to Bristol was probably actually to conduct matters of business. And he was quite an old man at this stage, being well into his sixties. And he stayed with his sister, Joan Jay, and the name is important, um, at a house in St. Thomas Street, while he conducted these affairs of business and carried out his, um, his itinerary. Some of the, entry, some of the entries in, a, in his account of Bristol's topography are difficult to interpret, but his accounts of conversations with ordinary Bristolians are particularly revealing, um, such as the discussion with a ferryman while he's crossing over the Avon, he's, he's talking to the ferryman about the distances of various points on the river and the height of Giston's cliff, part of the gorge uh, below what is now Clifton Observatory, or a discussion with a blacksmith about the height of these cliffs, or a discussion with the hermit who lived in the chapel on Brandon Hill about the height of the hill. So he's obviously got a very keen sense of curiosity about his native town. He wants to know things. He he measured everything. He was a very keen recorder of, uh, of measurements, whether in of streets or of individual buildings. His preferred unit of measurement were his steps or steppies. Um, uh, the measure being the length of his two feet when placed toe to toe. Uh, and this had been estimated by others as being about 21 to 22 inches, 56 centimeters. He also used yards and sometimes measured heights in fathoms. His attention to detail is amazing. It's made it possible to identify even incidental features of the landscape, such as wayside crosses, wells, and even privies. And here we have the central core as shown on the historic map. Um, and I'll just point a few things out. Here we've got the castle, probably the major medieval monument um, in, in Bristol. Once one of the most impregnable castles in the country, uh, King Stephen, the, uh, the Anarchy, the Civil War known as the Anarchy. Um, it was constructed by around 1088, um, initially as a timber Mott and Bailey castle, and then strengthened by Robert of Gloucester, the bastard son of Henry I, in the 12th century, um, with the erection of a stone keep 
uh, uh, built in white limestone from Caen. By Worcester's time, it went through a long and complicated um, development history. Um, but by Worcester's time, it clearly seen better days um, with the Great Hall and Constable, Constable's Quarters down here, for example, down the bottom left, um, being described as ruinous. And he says the latter caused him great sadness. However, the castle survived for another 170 years or so in playing a key role in the Civil War, um, but was largely demolished in 1656 on the orders of Cromwell. Also, while we've got this map up, I'll point, a few, point out a few other details. And we've got this thing called the Tolsey. The Tolsey is quite an interesting structure just here. Um, and I, I will, if I may, give you Worcester's description of it. And I'll just quote from him. I happen to have it here. Um, and he says, um, the place over against the Tolsey where the mayor and councillors of the town meet from day to day when it seems needful beneath the cover of a flat, uh, flat lead roof fronting the west door of Christchurch. There's Christchurch here. So it's outside the west door. And it measures five yards and on the other side fronting High Street, it measures, and we don't know, it's indecipherable number of yards. Um, the meeting hall of the councillors, as well as of the mayor, sheriff and bailiffs of the town and their chief councillors and of the chief merchants when it shall be needful is situated next to the Tolsey Court. So next door, it's, um, it's right next to the open meeting place over against the Tolsey, opposite the chancel of All Saints Church with rooms above. There's All Saints, which of course is still there and has much early fabric within it if you can get in. Um, most worthily furnished for the ruling councils of the said of the said town attached onto the south side of St. Ewan's Church. So there you can see quite a nice little bit of topographical detail about the Tolsey. And we actually we actually have an illustration of this. Here is the Tolsey. It's been had an, another story built up. This is illustrated by Millard in, in a little view. yet in, um, um, alongside his map of Bristol 1673. So here you've got basically the structure here, basically the structure that uh, Worcester's describing, and then it's had this second story added at some point afterwards. So if we go back to the, to the map, other little um, details we can see, apart from the main things like the churches and the, and the town walls, which are all shown here, the town wall shown, the early town wall shown in red around here, the later town wall shown around here, but the little things like latrine here, right by Aylwood's or Nether Pitay gate, and he has a description for that too. Um, so he, he's, 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 he's um, looking out for things, he, he talks about um, latrine. The public latrine um, in English, a privy for women as well as man, men is in the sub, wide southern area of the said triangle. And the triangle he's described in the previous section uh, as being alongside uh, Nether Pitte Gate. So this little triangle area with a latrine in the middle. Now he notices things like that, which I think is rather nice. Another monument is the pillory here in the middle of Wine Street. And his description for that is, um, the house of punishment and the public pillory situated um, about the middle of Winch Street or Wine Street um, in front of the end of the road from Pit Hay Gate. So in other words, it's the end of the road called Pit Hay here, coming up here. Um, it's circular, constructed in fine freestone work as broad as it is high with cells and windows with close bars of wrought iron. A circuit of the said, pillar, of said public building measures in length, and again, it's indecipherable, but it's a certain number of steps. And above the pillory building is the device of timber work built by carpenters 
to pillory wicked people or wrongdoers in baking of bread, torts, etc. Torts, I wonder if it's torta, like cakes or buns. So is to is to punish um, bakers particularly who'd be up on the pillory. And I suspect the bottom part, the ground level part with his bars, is probably a, a lockup, probably where the drunks went on a Saturday night. So, and again, we've got this wonderful description of, of little details within the streetscape in 1480. Um, so, <clears throat> another little feature to point out, which we, we, we've put onto the map, um, is the possible site of a ducking stool. This is not mentioned by Worcester, but there's, there's other documentary sources suggest that it's round here, near a place called the Watering Place, which Worcester does talk about, where the, the horses went to water, where um, Broad Weir, which is now underground, um, and the um, Castle Moat met and had this very watery area near Ells Bridge, again, long since disappeared, this watery area, and then possibly a ducking stool there. And I think we might be able to see it in this 19th century illustration from Breckery's collection. Here we have the, the, um, the River Froome, actually part of the moat of uh, Bristol Castle, Broad Weir, and then this little structure here may well have housed the ducking stool, which we think was at this confluence of these two watercourses. So that's quite another interesting little um, little detail. So we come to 1673. This is Millard's map, much used by by um, historians and archaeologists in their research. This shows the city pretty much at the fullest extent of the medieval of its fullest medieval extent. It was very shortly after this that the city started to expand in all directions. New industries started to come in, like glassworking, for example, which is shown on his next edition of 1715. Um, but this really shows the medieval, medieval town. The main exception, right near the middle, is the castle, which, as you can see, isn't there anymore because as I mentioned, it was demolished in 1656 and became a very profitable bit of real estate and new development, um, which was all still there until 1940. So what about Bristol? Bristol is a very early settlement, not Roman as was claimed in, by those two um, statues on St John's Arch, but nonetheless an early settlement, certainly around by about 1000 AD, probably before that, um, in fact. Um, it's the place by the bridge, Brigstow, that's what the name means. This is Bristol Bridge before its demolition in the 18th century, so it was a, a very fancy structure with um, multi-storied buildings um, over the stone bridge itself, this drawing about 1760. That bridge itself probably succeeded an earlier, probably timber structure, timber bridge, which may well have been the original uh, Saxon. Bristol was a town on the very edge. It was the, on the boundaries of the great kingdoms of Mercia to the north and Wessex to the south and on the border with Wales to the west as well. So it was an important strategic location. It always has been an important strategic location, but the fact that it's on the boundary between these two powerful kingdoms, I think might suggest an earlier foundation than 1000 AD. The castle, as I mentioned, was constructed by 1088. Um, replaced in the 12th century with a with a, a stone keep. Um, there had it had also a defensive circuit around the high ground. It's defended on three sides by the rivers Froome and Avon, 
and only on the east side was it undefended and it was probably a defense cutting off the um, uh, the narrow part of the ridge maybe along Dolphin Street we're not absolutely certain um, its medieval name was um, Defence Street Vicus de Defence so maybe that this was the line of the Saxon Eastern defensive line we're not sure um, this stone defence probably constructed in the 12th century but may well have replaced an earthen earthen timber defence um, defended this high ground on the three sides. And as I said, in the 11th century, the castle was constructed by 1088, really acting like the stopper in the bottle, if you like. There is also a strong suspicion, in fact, I think it's almost proven, that on the southern side of Bristol Bridge, which you can see here, there was a, uh, a further settlement called Arthur's Fee or Arthur's Acre, which uh, Roger Leach has um, suggested very strongly from documentary sources that it was a pre-conquest suburb, pre-Norman conquest suburb. And this is beginning to be proven archeologically as well. Um, some, some work was done in this area, which does suggest that it was, uh, that there was a defensive ditch um, dating to some time before 1066. So, um, by um, the 13th century, it was really beginning to um, outgrow this very small tightly constrained settlement on top of the hill, extended with town walls built on the south side, also along um, the south side of Redcliffe here, and further walls were built on the north side, right up to the River Froome. So the extent of the town was pretty much doubled at a, at a single stroke. The harbour was extended down in this area here, so that you had the River Froome was now cut, a new channel was cut in the middle of the 13th century through this marshy ground um, alongside um, where Queen Square is now. This land was all owned by St. Augustine's Abbey. There was a, a, a grant of land by the Abbey to the town for the, to facilitate the construction of this new harbor, new channel. And so until really the, um, to really the construction of the new cut in the 19th century. This was the main place where ships docked. The international trade came right up through to Key Head up here and docked um, alongside uh, this area here. So this is a major, huge transformation. In 1373, um, Bristol was rewarded by being granted the, the um, the status of becoming a county, the first provincial urban authority um, outside London to have this privilege, probably as a result of its um, uh, support to the King during the Hundred Years' War. At this point also, Redcliffe here on the south side was united with Bristol. Up until then, this area here had been part of Somerset. It wasn't part of Bristol. In fact, it was actually a great rival to Bristol on the North Bank, and the two were, were, were almost competing in some ways for the same um, trading markets. But this really united the two parts of the two sides of the river. So, um, giving a very potted history of Bristol, it's very difficult to do, but um, Bristol had connections all over Europe particularly in, in France in, with its uh, wine trade. Um, it was hit by the loss of Gascony in um, 1453, but it quickly revived. So 1480, it pretty much bounced back to where it was before. And it's just beginning, it's just, you can see the, the big, very beginnings of its interest in the Atlantic, the, and particularly the transatlantic routes. You've got um, 
the sailings by people like Robert Sturmey to the Levant or John Jay, and remember that name, Jay, um, um, sailing off to find the fabled island of Brazil in 1480. Uh, that's not Brazil, the country, that's this mythical island somewhere in, in the Atlantic, which was thought to um, be uh, a very important place for riches and so on. Uh, and Jay, coincidentally, um, was probably the half-brother of Joan, uh, William Worcester's sister, with whom he stayed when he came to Bristol. So there is this family link, which is very interesting. Um, here's just a couple of images showing the, the town wall is excavated here, the, the marsh wall um, running down the um, east side of the River Froome, uh, excavated in 2006 underneath a 1960s office building, but the wall had survived even the massive foundations of the, of the earlier office building. And then here we have Tower Harats on the port wall, this massive circular tower, 13 meters across, um, which is the base of the end tower of the port wall. And this is the Matthew, well, we all know the Matthew. Uh, this is the reconstruction built in 1997 of um, John Cabot's famous uh, vessel. And in this, or it's a uh, 15th century equivalent, he sailed to uh, the New World, landing probably in Newfoundland um, in uh, 1497. And again, he was probably not looking for Newfoundland or Canada or, the, or, the, or, or America. He was probably again looking for the Isle of Brazil and for a route through to the Far East. So Bristol was just at the beginnings of this new fascination with the transatlantic trade. Now, we all know, of course, um, from the late 17th century, it became one of the principal ports um, concerned with the transatlantic trade. So, um, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, one of the reasons for producing the map now is because there's been a huge amount of new research, new findings since 1975. And particularly from the 1980s and more particularly from the 1990s, uh, really as a result of um, new legislation relating to uh, the role of archaeology within the planning process. So from 1990, archaeology was it became an integral part of new developments that were going on from that date onwards so it's really um, up there with all the other considerations that city councils and developers have to think about we also have the results of these two at the, part of the start of my talk um, his work on the townhouse in medieval and early modern bristol this uh, shown on the left here. This is a result of um, almost a lifetime's work on his part, um, certainly from 1979, um, when he was um, working in Bristol, coming to Bristol, he started to research houses going around um, various basements and attics and various other buildings um, whenever he could, and he just carried that carried on with that research, even when he wasn't working here anymore, he'd come back and keep researching it until um, 2014, or before that, just before that, English Heritage um, commissioned him to publish all this research, and the fruits of it are this uh, amazing book. This is the definitive work on the townhouse in medieval and early modern Bristol. Um, I'm not sure how much it is now. It was selling for £100, but whether it's still that, I don't know. But it's a very well illustrated, lavishly illustrated and superb book. So if you can get hold of a copy, um, do so. And the right hand volume, um, I shouldn't say too much about it because I'm part of one author, but um, this was um, produced again um, as a result of much English heritage, uh, later historic England funding. Um, to really bring together the fruits of all the archaeological work um, that has happened really since the year dot. Um, it sets out, it starts by setting out uh, the background to the 
city's geology, um, its long history of archaeological investigation from the time of Worcester onwards, uh, and summarise the results of the um, sustained levels of archaeological fieldwork from the 1980s, especially onwards. So these two works really provided the, the, the basis for a lot of the information um, which is um, produced on the map. And just very quickly to end with, um, just some of the exciting discoveries that have occurred in the last 40 years or so. And I will concentrate in the, on the Redcliffe area, partly because I did a lot of work myself in that area, um, but also because some of the results have been absolutely spectacular um, from that area. I don't think anybody knows it, but it's it's quite low lying. It's it's quite waterlogged, so um, the archaeological survival is superb. And here we have one building um, which I was involved with quite heavily, uh, Canning's House, um, in on the west side of Redcliffe Street, facing out onto the river. Here we've got a, an image of it. in 1821 of the Great Hall, showing its wonderful roof. Uh, the same view, more or less, in the early 20th century, again, with its very fine arched braced roof. It had a lovely 15th century tiled floor, which was taken up in 1913, very sadly, uh, but is now the British Museum. And here we have a surviving part of what may well have been the Great Tower of Canning's house. William Canning's was mayor of Bristol. He's buried in Sir Mary Redcliffe, um, 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 very much a self-made man. He had 10 ships, according to William Worcester. Um, and in 1467, he withdrew from public life and took holy orders, having been mayor five times of the city. He became Dean of Westbury College in 1469 and died in 1474. So he was an extremely wealthy man, probably the wealthiest man in Bristol in the, um, in the 15th century. So his house, as I say, lay on the west side. Um, it was excavated um, over a period of about two years. Um, it started life as a, a before Canning's house, a simple 12th century um, um, series of buildings against Redcliffe Street, against Redcliffe Street with a river frontage right by Redcliffe Street. So in other words, the, the river had been pushed gradually um, away from Redcliffe Street by a series of dumping, dumped layers, which had a huge, wonderful uh, array of artefacts preserved in the, in the waterlogged mud. And here you can see on the right hand side, a couple of images, um, this arched uh, series of two arches, 15th century arches, part of Canning's Great Hall. But underneath all of that, We've got this long series of paving, um, walls, revetment walls, this is the river frontage here, um, timbers sticking out all over the place, a very deeply stratified and very complicated site. So you can see that's the series of steps, the wall you can see here, the river frontage by the 13th century being pushed from here to here, and then by the 15th century being pushed all the way from here all the way out to here. The huge amount of reclamation has taken place. Here we've got Canning's house shown on the historic map here, not far inside the 13th century town wall. To give you an idea of, of what kind of preservation we can expect, this is from the former Courage Brewery along the, uh, the north end of the Redcliffe area called Finzel's Reach. Um, the development is pretty much complete now and it's a series of um, apartments, offices, uh, restaurants and, uh, and also and a brewery, uh, which is very nice. Uh, but underneath all of that, this collapsed timber lined pit dating to 13th century, the timbers are pretty much perfect, um, preserved within this waterlogged mud equally well preserved with this wine cask, wine cask reused 
in the 15th century, still with its bunghole and maker's marks or vintner's marks on the side there, beautifully preserved. And it had been reused as a well. Uh, in fact, it was double barrel. There was an, another one on top, which wasn't as so well preserved. There was two wells stuck one on top of the other, uh, two barrels stuck one on top of the other to form this deep well. Um, one of the earliest excavations in Redcliffe um, was alongside Bristol Bridge. And here we have a um, 13th century water slide revetment formed of reused ship's timbers. And that's what these are here, just reusing up, up against the earth. And here on another site uh, alongside it, uh, we have this classic sandwich effect of reclaimed dumped earth, dumped rubbish with uh, clay bands in between representing the, the flood events. So it floods, more earth is dumped, it floods, more earth is dumped, and so on and so forth, until you get this build-up of organic material. And of course, this is superb for looking at the kinds of detail evidence for trade. So you may be able to see on this slide on the top, um, this purplish red uh, reedy deposit preserved in the in the waterlogged mud. This is actually madder, which gives a red dye. It was in, it's grown in this country, but it was actually imported quite widely from the no, low countries, from Netherlands and other, and, and uh, similar places. So this is well preserved here. In fact, it's still produced uh, a red dye when when used. Um, I actually managed to produce some red cloth from it. Uh, from another excavation um, on the opposite side of the street, you've got, again, there's a purplish red deposit on the, at the bottom of this cistern. This again is madder um, preserved in the bottom of the pit. Now, in this case, it's just been dumped straight into this, um, into this cistern. These are all dating to around the 13th and 14th centuries. So as part of the map project, we were able to produce this inset map showing the trades and where they uh, could be found, where we we're looking a moment ago, at dyers. And we know that dyers were operating alongside the river quite extensively. This whole area, in fact, was a cloth working enclave. You've got weavers here, the church, uh, temple church had a, um, a chapel dedicated to um, St. Catherine, who was the um, patron saint of weavers. Um, so that was there until the war. So weavers were here, you get dyers here, you have fullers up alongside the river. This street here is called um, Tucker Street or Vicus Fullonum, the street of the fullers. Um, you have tanners up here. On the other side of the river, um, you have cook shops, which Roger Leach has identified through um, uh, documentary sources. On the high street here, um, this is called Cook's Row. In fact, it's where you'd go for your, your um, hot food takeaway. It's a sort of medieval equivalent of, of um, KFC or McDonald's. A lot of houses wouldn't have had their own hearths, so you'd have gone out to get hot food from places like this alongside High Street. On um, the other side of the street, you've got the butchers, in a street called the Shambles. You may have know, may know of a similar street in York called the Shambles. Basically, that's the street of the butchers. Um, Cordwainers were in uh, Mary Laporte Street here. We have um, archaeological evidence for metalworking and tanning in this area by the River Froome, and equally archaeological evidence for iron and copper workers in the uh, River Froome side area along here. And you might, the, the, the sharp eyed amongst you might have um, seen, seen some of the less salubrious um, industries, if we can call them industries. On the north side here, we've got sex workers here and here. Um, this, um, this street I won't mention because we have polite company, a mixed company. Um, so I won't mention the name of the street, but you will see it on the map, what it was actually called, what its medieval name was. Um, this area, the bars, is interesting. Worcester himself says of the bars, um, this is the area where the wanton women dwell. Um, so he knew what he was talking about. 
So that's quite interesting. Shipbuilding, um, not surprisingly, is down by the river Froome. Um, you weren't allowed to um, uh, break through the town wall for the purposes of constructing ships. So they were they were forced to lie outside the town walls and they were alongside the river Froome. And there was some salvage excavation done in the 1950s where bits of ships were found during development work. So you've got all the these industries shown either from uh, logical or documentary sources. It's incomplete, it's not, it's not the be and end all, but certainly gives you an idea of how busy um, the medieval town was, or certainly the town in 1480. So finally, um, where can you get the map? Um, well, I understand you already have a copy of the map, so, um, um, but if you want to get a copy, you uh, can get it in the usual um, online booksellers like Amazon. Um, you can get it through bookshops. Uh, certainly Waterstones had it um, in Bristol. Um, so you should be able to get it from them. Uh, and if not directly from the shop, you should get it online. If you can't get it from there, you may be able to find it from um, the Historic Towns Trust themselves. And here at the bottom is the uh, website of the Historic Towns Trust where you can find a lot more about this map and others they produced, as well as seeing the digital version of the 1975 Atlas um, for Bristol and for other places. So there's a lot more information on the Historic, Historic Towns Trust website. And I think I've run out, it's probably as far as I can go. So if anyone wants to ask, to ask questions, I'll uh, do my best to answer. Bob, that's oh, absolutely that's super. Thank you. That's been quite fantastic. I've learned so much this evening. It's um, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, right. If anybody wants to ask any questions, please uh, unmute yourselves. I think you can unmute yourselves by pressing the space bar and uh, Bob will be happy to answer your questions. <clears throat> I feel I'm very much a newcomer, but I, I would really like to ask you some questions because, I mean, I, I, I live in and have grown up since 1949 in Whirl, which is a little um, now eaten up bit of Western Supermare. Mm, I know. And, and my only um, contact with Bristol at any close quarters has been when I had my first job there at Bristol University. And... I find your talk tonight so fascinating and so illuminating, and I really feel I've got to get up there as soon as possible with map. Uh, please do. And see if I can and see if I can sort out some of the things that you were talking about. Can you tell me anything about the fact that that there are so many um, places in Bristol that have the word red in them? Red. Yes. Um, and I assume that's the soil colour. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you're probably thinking about like Red Cliff. Um, yeah, Red Cliff and Redland and Redlands and. Uh, well, Redland, I'm not sure because uh, no, Redland. Redland isn't Redland. It's uh, Rod Redland is a more is a very modern um, yeah. spelling. I think it's, I've seen it as Roadland. Um, um, so I think that might be different. Yeah. Red Cliff yeah. is quite easy. Red Cliff is the Red Cliff of um, the Triassic yeah. Sandstone. Um, and you see that geology, um, this soft red sandstone um, on where, where the original settlement was, for example, where the castle yeah. was built and the early town was built. That's on red sandstone as well. So it's... it's I, 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 I recognise that as, 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 as a, a link, sort of, with world, because we, we have a, a seam of, of red marl that runs around the east of yes. Worldbury Hill. Yes. Including through my back garden. Yes. Um, and right through St Martin's Church, um, churchyard, and uh, all through the ancient parts of world. Yes. About, oh, I don't know, uh, 2012, we had a, a very interesting year when all the walls that had been built to keep back um, the geology and the soil and all the rest of it at the side of the hill, well, all the walls suddenly fell down. Oh. 
one in the churchyard and one a bit further to the east which was quite a big fall and one in my back garden <laughs> which is why i took an interest in it so well i, think I mean well, yeah red marl is 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 rather different from the from what i believe you have in bristol uh no it's called kuiper mark well no it's um Mercy and Mudstone. Sure. Mercy and Mudstone. Kuiper Mile used to be the it was the old term. It's oh, Mercy and Mudstone. Oh, and thank now, you. I, I'm not a geologist, but geologists now say, oh, you can't call it that, you call it this. Um, it's basically the right. same stuff. Very soft. You could yes. you can you can you know scratch a name in it with your fingernail. It's yeah. it's very, very soft stuff. And if when you it gets rich, wet, it really turns to um sort of like rivers of blood. It's like being yes. a song. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Anyone who's been digging on on a site on the in the at the top of Bristol in the in the in this in the early settlement soon knows it because they're tramping red footprints all over the right. place, brick yeah. red footprints yeah. all over the place. It and it, it didn't get out as well. It, it, it it's very sort of sticky stuff. Yes. Um, but if you go into Redcliffe Caves, which you can certainly on doors open day, I think they usually oh, open. Yes, I'll do that. Um, or if you're lucky enough. They sometimes hold plays in there. I've seen Macbeth in there, for example, um, which is a bit oh, strange. <laughs> it's quite an interesting it venue. Um, and I've actually, I've had the privilege of actually going right into the cage, which you can't do normally. I went in there quite a few years ago now with a potholer. Well, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating... the caves are actually run, or run for the City Council by the Axbridge Caving Club. Um, so I went with them, one of them. Um, the most terrifying experience I've ever had, but you go right into into um, into the bowels <laughs> of the cliff, and uh, it's um, it's quite an experience. But it is all this red sandstone, very soft. Could I add my ten pennies there, Andrew? Thank you. Please do. Oh, Bob! First of all, thank you for a lovely talk. It's really interesting. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, as you. As some people may know, but you can see it by looking behind me. I'm quite interested in pottery and porcelain, and you were talking about the Redcliffe area. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, of course, uh, all the. Uh, I think there was a medieval in Redcliffe Hill. I think there was a medieval pottery that's been excavated. Is that right? Um, then well, there were the in 1970, the, yeah, there yeah. was. I wasn't here then, but um, the the was. I don't believe it, but they they say they found the. The, the, the possibility of pottery waste being found there. I I would like to challenge that. Um, I don't think the, enough work was done. I mean, it, it's it's not fair for me to say because it wasn't there um, and it was a long time ago. But I suspect that that wasn't the main source of Redcliffe. There is a there is a pottery called Redcliffe Ware, um, which is. Um, they, they produce some lovely stuff, some lovely green glazed jugs, um, and um, um, it's produced somewhere locally, but I'm not sure it's there. I, I don't actually, I think it might be near the old market area, but I, I haven't got proof of that. But it's certainly local to Bristol. And then, of course, in the in the 17th century, there was Redcliffe back uh, with yeah, the Delfware yeah. potteries. Did, did any of that come up in your various excavations when you were uh, we would mind. have got some of that yeah yeah, yeah. um and we get um there's uh delftware pottery or we call delftware bristol delft um, <laughs> yeah, um it's, it's, a, it's a sort of copy um being produced out towards saint anne's um and the word that wasn't it wasn't possible to excavate that because the development that took place which is all the little houses <laughs> all there now um, they wouldn't allow archaeological work to be done. Um, oh. It was pre-1990. It was a Bristol Development Corporation who were brought in to sort of override the planning system, and they just didn't allow. I went out along there and was, did the best I could, but I couldn't really do much. But that was the site of the Bristol Beltware production, um, and we do get lots of that coming up in excavations. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a thriving... pottery industry after the Redcliffe 
and cease production. Because you, you've got this, sort of, all sorts of potteries are, are, are producing. You've got Ham Green, for example, which is very early. Um, Ham Green pottery, which was excavated quite a long time ago now, back in the... The one, the one that surprised me was Long 70s, Ashton, because that's where I was born, actually. I understand there was a pottery in Long Ashton in the medieval period. Uh, may have been, may have been. Yeah. Um, or there might have been. Uh, I, I, I'm know. not aware of that one, but certainly Ham Green. With that they were producing pottery. In fact, it was interesting about the Ham Green ware because we would get Irish archaeologists coming over from Dublin and places like that, Waterford, saying, "Well, we've been finding this pottery in 12th century contexts, um, and it's you know provably 12th century." And um, at the time, those who knew about these things saying, "Oh no, 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 it can't be that early. It's, it's 13th century." Um, and it's only when we started getting the same stuff in Redcliffe, alongside dendrochronologically dated timbers, that we realise that they, it goes right back to the early part of the 12th century. So the Irish were right. They were telling us, because it was being imported from, from Bristol over to Ireland with yeah. lots of other things. Um, so they were finding it in abundance and telling us what we should have known already, but we didn't find out for a little while <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> so, um, so they were right. <laughs> so that's, that's quite early stuff. That's really early. Thank you. Oh, well, can, I, can I perhaps Hello, ask? There, Andrew. Oh, can you go first? Okay. Well, oh, Jackie, go on. I think Sorry. Kenneth is there. I think oh, Kenneth, oh. Was Kenneth was first. Kenneth was first. I definitely saw. Okay, him. right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. Um, very, very simple question, if I may. Um, is there any indication as to roughly what sort of the population of Bristol was at 1480? How big was it? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, the, we, we've estimated, um, well, to slightly not answer your question, by about 1600, the population was roughly about 10,000. So it was maybe around about 6,000, something like that. But that, that's quite a difficult one to answer because we're only ever looking at the people who are rateable. So the very poor don't, yeah. don't count. Um, so you're missing out a whole lot of the population who just don't appear in documentary sources at all. But if we, we could probably say with rough, reasonable accuracy, we're talking about six to 7,000, something like that. Right, thank you. Dorian, you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, I, I was just wondering what was known about the, um, the, the the use of the thermal waters at Hot Wells and, and how long that dates back to. The, the use of the, sorry, I think you, that my screen froze at that point. You're asking about Hot Wells and how early it went. Yeah, the, the use of the thermal waters. Well, it goes back to the 18th century, very, very fashionable in the 18th century. But um, not beyond that. Not earlier than that as far as we know um certainly there didn't seem to be earlier exploitation of the mm. waters of hot wells of course the, the waters of hot wells are, you know goes back to uh, as long as the geology is there but um it would be interesting to know if for example I mean, there's no known medieval use yeah um, but whether there's anything prehistoric that is something That'd be an interesting question to pose because I know, for example, in Bath, they've proved Mesolithic occupation there on the site of the Baths. Yeah. So. Not that in uh, world. Sorry. We've got Mesolithic in world. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. use of use of the thermal use. waters. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's use. <laughs> it goes back to prehistoric times. There's there's no evidence for it, but it's so, so probably hot wells was a sort of Georgian challenge to Bath. Oh yeah, oh definitely yes, yeah. Mm. Um, it was definitely Bristol's answer to Bath, um, mm. and for a time it succeeded. It, it, it outdid Bath, but for a relatively short time. Um, yeah. I think some people got ill as a result of it, so it didn't <laughs> get a good press. Um, I'm not sure the waters of Bath are much better, but um, it, it, it. I don't think it was commercially as astute perhaps but it's certainly you know, for a time it did very well 
It's best remembered for Thomas Beddoes, who, who was a very famous yes. medical innovator. Yes, yes. Pneumatic institution. Yes, um, yes. But that was right, I think, at the tail end of Hot Wells. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to remember um, the Beddoes. Wasn't he into the 19th century? Well, it closed down in 1801. Yeah, and, yeah. And um, it, it, perhaps its greatest achievement was bringing Humphrey Davy into the world. <laughs> Mm. It was then poached by, by Joseph Banks and sent to London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Jackie, it, sorry, you missed out there. No, that's fine. I, I have a fascinating evening and I, I'm very, very pleased that we managed to book you, Bob. It's been really wonderful. That's very, um, a pleasure to be here. Yeah. We got our two copies of the map through the ALHA. Um, they have oh, right. With 11s. Um, and... I, the map itself, as you showed, it, it's a truly beautiful thing, isn't it? But it's so clearly laid out. Yes. The colours on it look beautiful. Um, and on the other side, which I don't know that you did show us really, there is this gazetteer. Well, I think, um, you yeah, um, know, all credit to the cartographer, yeah. Giles Dawes. For... Yes, it is lovely. But on, on the reverse, it's an absolute wealth of information, isn't there, which is well worth people pouring over. And if there's anyone in the Bladden, society who would like to have a look then do let one of the committee know and we can deliver a map to you or we'll make sure that when we do get back in our lodge for our face-to-face -face meetings we have them on display so that um which could well be march um when we next get together um we'll make sure we can see them there but uh, thank you very much indeed from from me and as you know representing the society mm, very welcome thank you for listening Yes, I, I add my thanks to that, Bob. Thank you very much. Anybody else, any, any final questions before we let Bob go? No, it seems oh, wow. not. Well, we hit a peak of over well over 40, Bob, so thank you very much. That's good. Thank you for coming. And uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, right. Thanks, everybody. And Thank there you. will be a recording of this available, so anybody who missed out or would like to listen again, um, that will shortly be available. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. 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 Bye.